pasa del número. Hello, testing. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone and thank you for coming. Um, welcome. We need to stand up. Right. Barry, can you move that? She's up. Do you want me up as well or just Yvonne? Okay. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> Shall I go up so you can see both of us at once? I don't know. You can see both of us, okay? <laughs> Okay, welcome to the Ed Sign Lecture, um, and we're very welcome. We're very pleased to see you such a large crowd. We're also um, streaming live tonight, so it will be on the internet afterwards if you want to watch it again. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Rachel Mapson tonight. Rachel qualified as an interpreter in 1996, and she's had 20 years' experience of interpreting. Ten years she's worked in London as an interpreter, and ten years here in Edinburgh. She trained first of all as an interpreter in um, Bristol, University of Bristol and she's returned to the University of Bristol to study for her PhD and the topic that she's signing on tonight is about the PhD. She's for fourth year out of six so she's getting on really well. Thank you Rachel. There's going to be a bit of a transfer now to the mics. If you just bear with us. Right, Thank you, mic. Okay, thank you very much Rachel for your introduction um, and yes you're absolutely right I am in my fourth year of my ongoing studies and it's a bit of a struggle doing both work and study at the same time it's pretty difficult let me tell you when I started my studies um, I really thought about what do I want to research and I thought I, I do want to research interpreters perspective um, and how they receive BSL and translate that into English um, but there was a bit of a problem with that really there's very very few publications available little research available in the topic of politeness in BSL and sign languages which is what my idea was so I thought I'll really have to find out more about politeness first before I can start looking at how interpreters interpret politeness in BSL. So tonight I'm going to talk a few about a few areas of my research, both politeness in BSL and my research into how interpreters interpret politeness. So really this is just to let you know what we're going to, to cover tonight. Politeness, why would I research that, is the first thing I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to talk about linguistic politeness and give you an overview of what that is. I'm also going to talk about the research that I've done into sign language and also the research I've done into sign language. And then finally, I'll summarise my conclusions for you. Remember, there's a few people arriving late um, and I will talk about that later, so just bear that in mind. So we'll start with a wee quote to get us off. Why would I research politeness? Casper said politic behaviour normally goes unnoticed, whereas rudeness is conspicuous. <laughs> 
So that means when there is no politeness, we're very aware of it as being something that's, that's not quite right. So politeness is important. So just to give you a sort of visual representation of the idea, if you look at the two parcels that I've got on the display, one's a bit rough and ready, the other's beautifully packaged with a ribbon, I'm just wondering which one you would prefer to receive. I expect most people would prefer the beautiful package with the bow, and maybe a few odd people would prefer the battered up old thing, but most people would prefer the lovely package. And actually, language is very similar. Most people prefer nice, polite requests presented to them in a nice way. And people are, are more likely to agree to a request like that. If I'm just asked very bluntly about something, I can feel a bit taken aback, and I'm perhaps more likely to refuse the request. <coughs> so really, politeness is important. It helps smooth communication. It's a sort of social lubricant, in fact. And interpreters really need to be aware and understand politeness in both languages that they use. So that means for us tonight, BSL and English that we're talking about. So how do you interpret politeness from sign language into English? And it's important to think about because not all languages use politeness in the same way. There's a wide variety. But let me know, politeness is not something that's just there and it's readily available. It's something that we have sort of subconsciously. We use it automatically without being fully aware of it. It's a kind of implicit knowledge that we have. And interpreters need to know exactly what politeness is in both languages. But another problem we have is, what is politeness in BSL? Like I mentioned at the start, there's very little research or information published on the topic. So for interpreters like me, who have a hearing family, their parents are hearing, who grew up and learned BSL as their second language, their L2, where do I get my knowledge about politeness from? So linguistic politeness, I want to talk about that. We've talked about politeness, I've mentioned it several times, but I want to clarify that I am focusing on language, polite language, not polite behaviour. It's a wee bit different. They are certainly linked, of course, but really my focus is specifically on polite language and how that is used. There's been a lot of research into linguistic politeness in spoken languages, going back a number of years. And really it started in the 70s, that's when interest was peaked in, in linguistic politeness. And perhaps the, the best known theory is by this couple of researchers here, Brown and Levinson. And they created their well-known theory talking about two different sides of politeness positive politeness and negative politeness. But negative politeness, what does that mean? Does it mean rudeness? Not really. So positive politeness is like when you're very supportive of someone and you're perhaps praising them and supporting them and making them feel very much included. Negative politeness is perhaps if you ask something quite directly, but you want to ask directly, but you do it in an indirect manner, a roundabout way. So both are different forms of politeness, positive and negative. Hmm, now their theory, a lot of people have criticised it for being oversimplified. Um, also because it's focused only on the speaker, not on the listener in any interaction. So fairly recently up until now, there's been more research, you know, really focusing on general politeness. And two researchers, Spencer and Oti, one researcher, sorry with a double barreled name, Spencer Oti, her name is Helen Spencer Oti, they came up with um, the, the title rapport management as a better term for describing what they um, developed as their theory. 
and it's her theory that I have used in my research. And I've overlaid it onto interpreting theories and interpreting research. So really, it's looking at language content and, and also non-verbal language as well, and also linguistics. And when we're thinking about politeness, it's useful to think about both negative and politeness, and positive politeness. And here's Thomas and Leach. They created this idea in the 80s about pragmalinguistics and also about sociopragmatics. Now, pragmalinguistics. It's like the sort of menu that we have in language. You know, if you go to a restaurant and there's a list of all the food that's available that you can choose from, it's very similar with language. Really, we can decide what's available for us to use from our language menu. And that is pragmalinguistics. Sociopragmatics is a bit different. It's whichever one we use linked to the specific situation and the cultural rules and norms that determine the situation that we find ourselves in. That's sociopragmatics. So it's probably easier if I um, explain this showing an example. <coughs> so these are examples from English about pragmalinguistics. The menu idea, remember? So give me the pen. There's different ways of asking. If you want to borrow someone's pen, these are your options. You could say, give me the pen. Or you could say, can I borrow your pen? Or could you pass me the pen? Could you pass me the pen, please? Or would you mind passing me the pen? There's a whole range of options that are available to us as speakers. So that's the menu idea associated with pragmalinguistics. But which one matches which situation? It really depends on who's asking. Now let's talk about the people who arrived late. <laughs> so when you arrive late, you have different options on your menu. You could not apologise at all. Or you could give a brief apology and say quickly sorry. Or you could make quite an elaborate apology, saying, oh, I'm sorry, it was raining, the bus was late, oh, and there was huge problems with the traffic, and go on and give a lot of detail and explanation <laughs> about why you were late. So depending on where you are, you make a choice about which one from your menu to choose. For example, say you find yourself in a business meeting. Or if you're meeting friends, or arriving at this lecture tonight, perhaps, you would choose a different option to explain your lateness depending on the context of the meeting in which you find yourself. So if you arrive a bit late at a lecture like tonight and you come in, you maybe feel a little bit daunted and sit down. Or do you just arrive and I'm not bothered and you just go and get your chair? Well, perhaps it's because you don't want to interrupt. That is appropriate. That's absolutely fine. But if I arrived late tonight, that would be a slightly different situation. Maybe you've all been sitting here as the audience waiting, where on earth is Rachel to give this presentation? And then I arrive, and I start, and you're like, come on, no apology. Why is she not apologising for arriving late? You would expect an apology for my late arrival. You would expect me to give an elaborate apology explaining why I was late. So that's the area of socio-pragmatics. It's really linked to the different expectations in any given situation. Now, in addition... <laughs> well, perfect example. Here we have it. Thank you. <laughs> so, it would be nice to have a brief apology, but there we go. <laughs> So we've talked about the two different options, but also remember that all languages have different pragmalinguistic um, <coughs> option menus and different sociopragmatic expectations. 
and both can be different, or perhaps it's just the pragma linguistic menu that's different, or perhaps it's similar and how we decide to use it in the socio-pragmatic context is different. So there's a lot of variety in that area. So a, a lot of examples have been given up to this point about requests and apologies. And indeed a lot of the research has focused on these two areas, on, research, on requests and apologies. There was a very large project done in the 80s, a CCSARP project, Cross-Cultural Speech Acts and Realisation Project, that was the name of it. And they compared eight different languages and looked at linguistic differences people that had grown up using the language as their first language compared to second language users. And the second language users, the way they used politeness was very different from people who used the language as their L1. So there's been a lot of research, as I mentioned, over spoken language. Um, in the area of politeness, but not so much over sign languages and how they use politeness. There has been some research in ASL, American Sign Language, by Roosh in 1999 and Hosa in 2001 and 2007, and also in Japanese Sign Language. and also in Brazilian Sign Language. And it's very interesting. Recently, I found out about that research. And I was very lucky because my supervisor, Rachel Sutton Spence, well, she's in Brazil at the moment, and she found this piece of research. And it's only published in Portuguese. It's not available in English. So we all have no idea about that work that's going on. But there's a book about the Brazilian Sign Language Grammar and there is a whole chapter talking about politeness. It was ideal. So really, what they've been talking about in the research into politeness so far and what sign languages share in common around politeness is the use of non-manual features. So I will explain in a bit more detail about American Sign Language because that's the sign language that most is known about in terms of politeness. So HOSA identified five different non-manual features that are involved in politeness. So I'll try to demonstrate to them, to them to you. So we start off with the polite pucker, then we have the tight lips, a polite grimace, a polite grimace mixed with a frown and a body or a head teeter. Okay, so those are the five. So decided that um, if it's a, a simple demand that's been made, a simple request, typically they will use a low, in, if it's a low imposition request, typically they will use a response that will be for um, in, the, in the, the lower, the top half of the list. If it is a higher demand that is being made, typically you will find the lower um, facial features that are described in this list being used. So, let's think about America and Britain. We've talked about America. Um, but what is politeness like in British Sign Language? So I've looked at online um, interpreting and the lexicon that has been used. And there's been research into, my own research has been into the lexicon that's used, non-manual features, the discourse strategies that are employed, and also the kind of influences that are used when we're using politeness. So my research involved five deaf people and they were all professionals and they'd all been to university 
two men, sorry I'm trying to remember here, there was two men and three women involved. And two of them have married a hearing person and have deaf parents and three of them have hearing parents. So let me clarify that, sorry, three had deaf parents and two had hearing parents. So the interviews involved um, open questions about what are your views about politeness, what do you think it is, for example. And then also, um, the, I wanted to get some elicited comments from them, asking about their signs that they would use, specifically talking about requests and apologies. And I wanted to base that on the previous research on requests and apologies that I mentioned earlier. But I found it was a little bit different from the American Sign Language research. Because American Sign Language requests had focus on requests and refusals, so it's a little bit different from requests and apologies. So at the start of the interview, I asked by saying, you know, please can you sign these phrases to me? And I got a bit of paper and I showed it to them. And then I asked them to sign it to me. So to start, I said, you know, can you ask me to borrow my pen? It's a simple request, there's nothing difficult in that. And then I need you to apologise to me for losing my pen. It's not a big matter, so not a serious apology. And then something that's a bit of a more high imposition request. Can you take me to the airport early on Saturday morning? So then that was put aside and we continued with the interview and I asked some questions. And then later on, I asked them for some more examples of signing. And I said, but this time I don't want you to sign directly to me. I want you to imagine you're at work and that you've got a deaf boss and I want you to imagine that you're making these requests to that person. So again, I said, can you ask to borrow his pen or her pen? Could I have a holiday off next week? Or apologise for handing in some paperwork late? Or apologise for damaging their car in the car park? I mean, that's the worst of the situations, obviously. So when I compared the difference between when they were signing to me and when they were signing to their boss um, and also whether they were making simple requests or more difficult requests, high in position or low in position requests, it was, it was interesting to see the difference and make the comparison. Now, I wonder if the boss was signing with this, the signs, the hearing with the if your boss was hearing, would they use the same signs as they would if the boss was deaf? Would the signs change? Or if your boss could sign, or if you had to bring in an interpreter, how would you alter the register and what would the influences be on your language? You know, there are explicit signs in BSL for marking politeness, same as other sign languages, but really the most important thing is the use of non-manual features. Now we can divide these into three broad areas. There's the upper face, the mouth, and also the head and upper body. Now I'll explain really about six of the most important issues surrounding this. So, thinking about the upper face, there's two main expressions, raised eyebrows and also semi-closed eyes. Now, the raised eyebrows, you would expect a question as a sign language user and a response of <coughs> yes or no. Eyebrows are raised, do you expect a closed question? But looking at the data, <coughs> I think it has a double function in BSL. Because I believe that, you know, when people are feeling they want to be polite, they use raised brows to show the politeness. But it's not also for requests, but also for apologies, raised brows are used for politeness. Now, the semi-closed eyes, that's used less, it's not as frequent. 
but it's used if it's a, a high imposition request. Um, maybe like the idea of a holiday next week, that's when you, you would see that, that occurring a lot, the semi-closed eyes. And it's similar to some apologies in BSL as well, that's used. Now the mouth again has two different characteristics. And it's interesting, American Sign Language has exactly the same tight lips as we have in BSL and also the polite grimace, both of them are in both sign languages. And Hosa said that the tight lips, it's like a default polite facial expression, non-manual feature that is mostly used. You can use it for low imposition or high imposition requests. It's used frequently and actually it's the same here. They're both used in high imposition and low inquisition requests and apologies. Now, the polite grimace is a wee bit different. <coughs> and American and Japanese sign language have this non-manual feature as well. So it's used with a high imposition request and also with apologies. It's not used for low imposition simple requests. Now thinking about the third of the issues we talked about, the head and the upper body. American Sign Language does have um, this, this head and body tilt at the same time, but really I didn't find it in my data. But what we do have in British Sign Language is a head tilt. A side tilt, I've called it here on the slide. So it can be called a silent tilt and it seems to work the same way as the head and upper body tilt and that is linked to requests. And sometimes it is used simultaneously with the polite grimace. And also sometimes with the raised eyebrows, so sometimes you can get all three happening at once. Usually it's the tight lips rather than the polite grimace that is used with the tilt. And then the last on the list, I called a polite duck. Now it's not really a duck, it's that kind of duck. So the head moves forward. And that's for high imposition requests. And sometimes for apologies, but usually for requests that you're anticipating will be difficult. And that is linked with the tight lips. And sometimes with raised brows or semi-closed eyes. So sometimes you get something like this, for example. And when it's linked to a head tilt, it looks like this. Or like that. <laughs> so I talked about the influences that were operating in politeness in BSL. So now I want to talk about them. So what are the influences? Of course, context influences how we use politeness. <coughs> and some influence from status as well. So if you're talking to your boss who is of a, a higher status, you might be influenced to use politeness in a slightly different way. And um, that seems to be more prevalent in spoken language compared to sign language. I think the idea of status has less influence in sign language. But a very strong influence in BSL seems to be social distance. So it's a person that you either know well, could be said to be socially close, or a person that you don't know very well is more socially distant. And it really depends as well um, if the person is deaf or hearing. You know, if it's a deaf person that you know well, another deaf person, or the first time that you've met them because they're deaf, that can create a social familiarity. But when you think about hearing people, you have to, the deaf person would have to assess their signing skills, be sure that they were clear. Perhaps they changed their signing to become more towards the SSE end of the spectrum. And it's the same if a deaf person works with an interpreter they know well. You know, if they know well, um, they don't, if they know the interpreter well, perhaps they make less adjustment to their signing towards English. And if they know them less well, they might sign towards, more towards the English end of the continuum. So, when does the signing change to become more English and how does it change? As I talked before, 
um, as I said before, BSL actually has explicit signs like sorry or it's fine, don't worry, um, linked to politeness, a bit like the words in English like please and thank you. And of course, please and thank you are used more in spoken language compared to sign language, where they're not used so much. There was one of the interview candidates who said that really they felt that um, hearing people created those, those rules, those norms about saying please and thank you and the signs for please and thank you that they use in sign language when they're signing, they created them when they were learning. They aren't instinctive signs part of BSL. And also, thinking about morphology, and morphology is strongly linked to the mouth. Remember I was talking about the, the tight lips and the grimace, linked to politeness in BSL. Now, in English, you get English mouthing when the deaf person adapts their signing more towards English and they will drop the lip patterns we talked about and they move more towards the English end and use English word mouthings. And they would add the politeness marker, the lip patterns, at the end of their expression. So, maybe signing to another deaf person, they would just simply sign sorry but they would, if they were talking to a hearing person, they would add an additional sign, I'm very sorry, and sign that explicitly. And that wouldn't be used in a natural sign language conversation between two BSL users. And also, you can see that the influence is there from the English word order, the English syntax. It's different from just sorry with the, the non-manual feature of the tight lips. Um, so there's lots of differences comparing those influences. The interpreters are just changing over the microphone, so we'll give them a minute. <coughs> so now I'll tell you more about the interpreting study that I, I completed. Now I mentioned before that different languages and different cultures do politeness differently. So you would expect that BSL and English politeness is different and it's used differently. So I mentioned the five people that I'd interviewed as part of my research and what things influenced them to become more English in their signing or um, use different non-manual features. Now they weren't all the same and that wouldn't be the same for all BSL users. That's not something I can generalise because it was only five people I'd interviewed. But what is pertinent is that interpreters need to be aware of all these different forms of politeness in BSL and how to translate that into spoken language. So just because these explicit markers aren't perhaps there and perhaps the sign for please or thank you isn't used doesn't mean that people aren't being polite. So it's important that interpreters are competent in recognising different forms of politeness. So the next part of my study really was to explore how interpreters do recognise politeness in BSL and then what kind of strategies they use that to translate into English. So this involved eight experienced BSL English interpreters, all highly experienced and all had a minimum of 10 years interpreting experience. Seven of them actually had over 15 years of interpreting experience. And I looked at two different groups. Four of them had deaf parents, we can call CODA. They were children of deaf adults, they had deaf parents. And the other four were, like myself, um, hearing from non-deaf family backgrounds. <coughs> and within each four, there were two male and two female participants. So let me think. I had the two different groups. And in one group we looked, we met three times and discussed the issues, in the other group was the same, we met three times. And within each one we spent around two hours as part of the research. Again took the form of open questions, um, I then showed the participants some video clips to try and elicit further comments. Um, I'd ask them to watch and whether they thought it was polite, whether it wasn't, how they would imagine interpreting that into spoken English. And the video clips, they were very similar to the requests I'd made of the deaf research participants. So things like, can I borrow your pen? I've lost your pen. How would you apologise for that? I've damaged your car. Very similar. These were separate, I should stress, that, that it wasn't the, the same comments I showed them. It was um, These were filmed separate clips. <coughs> 
And there was a lot of findings come out from that research that I don't have time to go into tonight, and it's not quite finished either. Um, so I'd just like to draw your attention to some of the important points. First of all, how interpreters learn politeness, then how they recognise politeness, and also the influence of familiarity with your deaf client. So if we look now at learning politeness, all participants said, OK, if I think about how I actually learned politeness, of course, from my parents, you know, parents would model language and you would see examples of how to use that. If I made a mistake, I was corrected on that. And sometimes they were explicitly taught about politeness from their parents. And that's echoed in other research that would say that parents very rarely provide explicit instruction on the rules of politeness for children. Usually, they'll be told not to do something and corrected only when a mistake's made, and that's how people learn. People learn these things implicitly rather than being actually taught the rules of politeness. What also emerged from both groups, um, as we've said, they would have four were CODAs, so they would have learned BSL as their first language and grown up with that in the home, um, whereas the hearing interpreters who are from a hearing background would not have learned it until later in life as a second language. <coughs> So that would then have taken the form more observed language acquisition, what they would see as being used as polite language and how other people use that is primarily how they've learned. So interpreters who didn't have deaf parents would have learned primarily the rules for English politeness, whereas CODAs would have learned the BSL rules for politeness within the home, but also English from their language contact with hearing people. What was interesting from both groups, though, was that even though when we asked them to explain what are the rules in BSL, what are the, what are the politeness rules, you know, were you ever taught those explicitly? They couldn't explain that. They would say, oh, well, it's maybe, you know, been within something else and it's maybe been taught under informal, informal, or when we looked at intent or when we looked at other things, maybe looking at different styles, looking at meaning, Politeness was maybe in there, but it wasn't a specific item on the curriculum that they would have been taught about. Now, p children who have grown up with deaf parents have that knowledge, and it's almost implicit, it's intuitive. But for interpreters who have learned BSL later in life, then where would they pick that up from? Because they wouldn't have grown up with this as a natural language in the home. And if they weren't explicitly taught that, then where do they learn politeness and BSL from? From observation, primarily, they say, okay, that's polite, that's rude, this is how I should express apologies or express requests. So when we talked about the, the language menu, and they, they, can, they have the menu, but we'll see how that works out. So the names at the bottom, you see there's been a lot of different research looking at second language acquisition and how people acquire and understand politeness. Now, if you're learning a second language, of course you would learn politeness in a different way. It's not intuitive, it's not implicit for you because you're learning as your second language. And often these people would typically use the same language rules that they've learned for their first language. So more often than not, they'll borrow things from their L1 and then use that in their L2. And I'm sure you've all seen that, you know, for example, the hearing sign interesting. If interpreters or hearing people say, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, you know, in a, in a conversation as a, as a way of back channeling. And I use it myself because hearing people when they're chatting say, oh, right, oh, yeah, that's interesting, oh, that's interesting, oh, as a form of back channeling a conversation. It's not actually a sign that deaf people would naturally use in a conversation. They're probably more likely to use this sign on the chest. But this sign interesting? Probably not. So I think deaf people probably look at us and go, are you itchy? Are you always scratching your body? What is it with hearing people? They always use that sign. So I think that's an example of using that polite rule in English and borrowing it into the L2 where it's not as effective and doesn't function as a polite marker. Also, second language users have a much shorter range of language options to use. So their language menu is much reduced. And then they'll use those strategies repeatedly. Often what you see, and again myself, I'm guilty of it in the past. Before I would have said, you know, the sign for fantastic, V, 
great. And actually, deaf people don't use that all that much. Hearing people, we're always giving it V, V, fantastic, fantastic, but that's not actually used that often. And of course, it can be polite, but it's overused, so it's used inappropriately. So actually, the people who acquire sign language as a second language have a much smaller range of strategies, but you use them more often. And perhaps an L2 user will be less polite in some situations because of these reasons. So again, from both groups of participants, um, what came out from the discussions was how politeness is recognised. And both acknowledged that, yes, non-manual features is hugely important within politeness. So when I spoke to the CODA group, I said, OK, so what, what, what does politeness look like? Well, there, well there's non-manual features. Right, so what do they look like? What non-manual features, what do they look like? That was from the non-CODAs. Then even when I spoke to people whose parents were deaf, Again, they would say, oh yeah, there is, mm -hmm. what, what are these, what are they? And it was hard to pin down. So it was actually quite a hard discussion because they didn't have the meta language to talk about this. They, they knew what it was, but they didn't know how to talk about it. They were very creative, however, and came up with some other solutions. One solution was to act it out. So there was four of them. Right, okay, we'll show you, right, we'll sign this way, you go away and then come in and interrupt me and we'll show you this way. And that's what's polite, that part there, that's what... So being able to act it out and show what those non-manual features were. The other way was they used very creative m metaphors yeah, and as a way of labelling it to say, oh, well, you know what that means. So they would use metaphors. And I'm going to check your memory. Remember the six politeness markers that I mentioned in BSL? I'm going to show you some of the metaphors and see if you can match these to them. Okay? So Wallace and Gromit, you probably know the animation. What politeness feature do you think that is? I mean, that, that grin there exactly is polite grimace, of course. I think actually we should change that to be the polite Gromit. I think people would remember that more and would understand that more. What about this one here? The Titanic. The side tilt? Mm-hmm. The Churchill dog from the television advert for car insurance. Yeah, with the shoulders and the head moving. Polite duck. And lastly, I wonder if you recognise this photograph, this picture. Yep, I've had a response from the audience. King Richard III of England. I, should, I think I should say that to situate that, that we are in Edinburgh, so this is King Richard of England, who's not a Scottish king. What do you think he would be? What do you think he could represent? Really a combination of the side tilt and the polite duck. Because you'll be aware that he's um, rumoured to have a, a spinal injury and remember they'd found him in the car park, they recently found his remains and they said that there was a spinal injury there. So the, the curvature of the spine almost shows the kind of tilt and the polite duck. So there were very creative metaphors that came out of the participant groups. <coughs> One of the third themes that I mentioned also is familiarity. And that's something that very much influences what type of politeness people use, whether they know someone well or not. And what I looked at was whether that influences interpreters in their spoken English interpretation, whether they know the deaf person well or whether they don't, and it was shown to be a factor that does influence the interpretation. So as an example, one of the interpreters, Angus, said, if I don't know them well, you'd probably err on the side of caution and make it possibly more polite. Because you don't want to be the instigator of a situation that wasn't there or isn't there. You don't want to ignite something by the wrong intonation or giving the other person the wrong impression. Again, another interpreter, Ollie, mentioned. I was thinking about something that happened recently where I was struggling to know. So the deaf person had seniority, but I was struggling to know how they use their seniority because I didn't know them well enough. And because I didn't know what they usually do, I didn't know if today was any different or I didn't know if today was the same 
and I needed to keep building their typical picture. And what is the picture? And it's really tough. You need to see things more than once to understand those things because they're complicated. It's just so multifaceted. So the responses from the deaf interviews, mm -hmm. deaf people said, if I don't know the interpreter well, then I'll probably use more English in my signing. I'll probably sign slower, I'll change my pace, I'll make sure I'm clear. But communication doesn't flow well, it can seem stilted when I have to do that. And deaf participants also mentioned that concern over the accuracy of the voiceover. From the interpreted participants, they said, if I don't know someone well and there's a lack of familiarity there, I don't know how relationships work. I don't know how they interact with other people, what's normal for them. So it's difficult to assess if I'm accurate or not. How am I able to judge if it fits in well? So they talked about having to use a safe interpretation and being even more polite. Now, if there is familiarity there and you're working with someone you know well, one of the interpreters says, I think it helps you be more focused. Rather than having to be quite broad and generalise, you can be more selective. You know, in knowing relationships, you know how people talk to one another. And this is from one of the deaf participants, what they said. And this is my translation of it. They said, it really depends on who the interpreter is. That's why I like to use regular interpreters who know me well, know my personality and my style of doing things. Because they can then reflect that in their English interpretation. If the interpreter is not someone who knows me, then I have to make sure that I'm giving them the right words to say. And unfortunately, that affects the whole communication flow. So when there was familiarity with an interpreter, deaf people said having that trust there was important. The fact that that trust existed improved <laughs> the communication flow and they were much more confident in the interpreter's ability to reflect their individual style. Interestingly, from the interpreter participants, they said if I know the, the deaf person well, I'll also know how they interact with other people and their relationships and that will inform my English interpretation and I'm better able to provide an accurate reflection for that client. So it would seem that deaf people are keen to work with interpreters they know well. Interpreters are keen to work with deaf clients they're familiar with. But more recent research that I've done also shows that hearing professionals are keen to have regular use of interpreters. So two years ago, actually in the south of England, um, this was research that was done. And it should be published soon, it's actually in press. Um, I've written with Mark Sch Schofield, um, co-authored this publication that will be out soon, and really involved healthcare professionals <coughs> from a range of GPs, hospital doctors, nurses, dentists, ophthalmologists, audiologists, physiotherapists, the whole gamut of general healthcare professionals. There was 41 participants who filled out a questionnaire. <coughs> And from that questionnaire, 12 of them were interviewed. And what came out resoundingly from the interviews um, was that they prefer their deaf clients to have a regular interpreter for their healthcare appointments. And they said that having the same interpreter for a series of appointments means that the three of us within the action are able to develop trust. They said it also improved the interpreter's knowledge of the terminology, the specific jargon that would be used within that healthcare appointment for that deaf person. And they actually said that when they don't know the interpreter, if it's a new face that's in, then they feel more distracted to work with them. But if it's someone they know well, they're able to focus more on their patient and it actually reduce the intrusiveness of the interpreter. So if they're able to focus more on the patient, then of course that's going to result in improved care and treatment for them. You know, potentially that has a huge impact on the health care received by deaf people. So I'm nearly finished. You'll be happy to know. Now, I'm aware that my research has weaknesses, as it does all research. And some of the limitations, probably the number one would be me as the researcher, for two reasons. I'm a new researcher. The PhD that I'm doing um, is the first time I've been doing research. So this is a learning curve for me. 
but also the fact that I'm researching BSL politeness and myself as a hearing person, not from the deaf community originally, and I'm collecting data in a community that's not one I've grown up in, potentially could have an impact. I also didn't observe real life situations. All the data I have was collected from interview and comments were elicited, so this wasn't naturally occurring data. It really is though the first research into this topic. So it's still useful to have this kind of information to build the picture and set the scene for future research. I'm also aware that politeness is not an easy subject to discuss. It's not something that comes up in everyday conversation. Even if you were to ask me about politeness in English, my first language, well, now I'd be able to tell you a lot more about it because I've done more reading, but before then, it's not something that we automatically have the language to describe. So much of it is intuitive. You know, it's so implicit knowledge. It's not there at the forefront of our brain to discuss. And when you start asking people about it, it can be hard to get responses because they don't have that language to describe it. I think interpreters do have to have that knowledge ready, though. In both languages, that has to be explicit knowledge for them because it's relevant in their everyday job. It has to be information that's readily available. But it can be very difficult to be able to identify BSL politeness because there's not enough research on it and there's also probably not been a lot in, in how it's been taught. So research in politeness and BSL could benefit a lot of people, potential interpreters, but also deaf tutors. It would give them additional resources that they could use for teaching and it would be another area to include within their tuition. This is the book written by Jack Hosa that I mentioned, Into ASL Politeness, and I really like the title. But it says it's not what you sign, it's how you sign it. I think politeness and BSL, it's not just about the manual signs. It's about the whole features of the language and it's how it's signed. And especially interpreters need to recognise how something is signed politely to be able to match that and deliver an equivalent within their spoken language interpretation. Because when you do it well, nobody notices. It's when you do it wrong that you become the centre of attention. So going back to the original quote I had at the start, you have to know that's me now finished. Thank you. Hold on, Sven. Hold on. I'm not tied up. <laughs> Apologies. Too many different things. Microphones, interpreters, speakers, signers, etc. So thanks again, Rachel, for this really, really fascinating talk. Um, really interesting. Thanks. We do have time for questions. Um, probably about 20 minutes, half an hour or so. So I would invite people now to come forward if they have a question. Um, anybody? <laughs> Suzanne? BSL. Um, but what came to mind was culture and the value for time and how that might impact some of the work that you know we know that or, um, that or affect cultures around the world that don't necessarily have the same value for time and would that then impact the kind, what politeness looks like in those particular cultures and I wonder if that's emerged at all in any of your literature if you've seen anything related to um, like you know I, I can't think of the culture specifically that doesn't um, actually have a word for time in their language, but that there are other cultures that don't have that same value. 
Um, yes, issues of time kind of uh, relate to the socio-pragmatic kind of norms of different languages, and, and they will be different. And uh, I suspect there are differences between um, deaf community in Britain and the hearing community here, and our expectations over issues to do with timing, not only to do with, uh, you know, maybe how critical arriving late is or not, but also how you go about apologising for that. And I can't remember the author's name, but um, I read something recently that came up with a beautiful term, <coughs> which is temporal granularity. <laughs> which basically means the amount of detail that people will go into about something. So, for example, if um, a person arrives late and they give you the detailed explanation of everything they did since they got up in the morning and what they had for breakfast and uh, you know, what time it was when they left the house and then they tripped over on the garden path or whatever, and they give you that level of detail and that will be a cultural thing and that there are some cultures, some languages that expect to have a very high degree of granularity um, and others where that granularity is, is very different and you wouldn't have those expectations, so you wouldn't have that detail. And I, I think you know, from, uh, this hasn't come out in my research, but you know, from my own sort of observations, I can certainly see differences in <coughs> temporal granularity between uh, BSL and English in, in certain situations, yeah. Cool. Any other questions at all, Andy? That wasn't very polite, was it? Pushing the presenter off the podium. That's terrible of me. I'll be polite now, Rachel. Thank you for your presentation. That was interesting, was it? That was th thanks for your presentation. That's the wrong sign. That's my hearing sign. Um, I think that's fascinating, the research you've done so far about how politeness occurs and what it looks like and how there's been so little research. I wonder though, deaf people who have grown up using interpreters, I mean we, we know in the future that the deaf community is changing, there are more people using cochlear implants and less people learning sign language younger, so there will be a different, deaf culture will look differently in the future. And they may not be as skilled in the use of non-manual features and these things that are an implicit part of the language because of the type of language they'll be learning. So I think there's probably going to be more challenges for interpreters in the future. Because with each generation, the language use changes. Would you agree with me? Do you want to speak? Okay. <laughs> Yes, Andy, I would agree with you. And of course, this isn't static. Language use isn't static. Language evolves and changes through time. And you would expect that in spoken language and in sign language in BSL. So our job really as interpreters, I expect, will change in the future. Mm -hmm. there Was there another part to that question have I missed? You're signing? No, I'm not signing. Good. <laughs> Hi, that was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. What I'd like to know is, as we all know that regional variations exist in BSL, do the politeness markers change as you go around the country? Is it the same in Scotland and Ireland and England? Um. Oh. <laughs> it just adds interest. Interest, yeah, there you go. Um, uh, my research was with the, with the deaf participants. They were not, uh, they were from all over the UK. 
Um, I think um, in terms of the non-manual features, there didn't seem to be any difference between them based on where they came from, based on their gender, or even whether they had deaf or hearing parents. They were all producing the same markers. Um, one difference, there was a lot of difference in signs for sorry. That seemed to be the major difference out of the data that I've collected. Um, I would anticipate that the, the, the non-manual features that I've described would be fairly widespread throughout the UK. That's my, my feeling. Um, but as I say, I only researched with five participants, so uh, it's not to say there wouldn't be any variation. Frankie had a question. I'll stand up because I'm smaller and it makes everyone can see me. I don't know if this is really a question, it's more of a comment to add, Rachel, um, linked to Andy's point there um, about the, the use of the politeness in the deaf community. And I think, yes, we need more research into politeness and how it's used in sign language. But it made me think um, of a couple of things. First of all, how politeness is learned and how it's learned from others in observation. I actually believe that some politeness is intuitive, you know, because for deaf people, you know, they may not see other signers, they may be hard of hearing or cochlear implant users, but will still exhibit the same non-manual features, but they haven't learned that through observation. So I think that some of it must be biological. I think that'd be interesting to research whether it's, you know, nature or nurture. Maybe you disagree with me, Rachel. That's a good point, Frankie. I think as well what would be interesting to see is how hearing people use those features and if they use any of them in the same way. There has been some research in America looking at the eyebrow gaze and how non-manual features are used when people are hearing but have deaf parents or are hearing with non-deaf family. And that was specifically looking at questions, and it wasn't linked to politeness, it was just looking at question forms. And what did come out of that research was that there are the same non-manual features, but they're used in a different way. The timing is different. So they use, when they use it is different. When coders use that, they use it in a very strongly grammatical way, and you know, grammatical to ASL. Whereas others use it, but in a different way. So it's almost like... Like, the, you know, it, the strong ASL users um, who have deaf parents would use it almost with the volume up um, in a much stronger way. But I think there's, there needs to be more research out there. And of course, there will be other hearing people who use it, but it could just be that they use them differently. Could be. So there's that research. There was another one, a link to that one. I'm trying to think of the name of that. It's gone. Oh, no. Jenny Pyers and Karen Emery were the two researchers who looked at that around 2008 in ASL. I have a question. Within Hearing Society, do you feel that they understand that hand shape? You know, that deaf people maybe haven't used that hand shape, but maybe the hearing population used that, you know, thumb up hand shape, and that the deaf community have maybe absorbed that hand shape into their language? You know, same with other non manual features like hearing people would use the eye roll. Has that maybe been included in BSL, or has one influenced the other? I'm interested in your thoughts on that. The short answer is I don't know. But that hand shape, I think, some of the deaf participants um, felt that that was very strong, a BSL sign. That was a polite way of expressing your politeness, is to use that hand shape. Hearing people would use that as a gesture, but it's used differently. It's not used as part of a language as such, as part of the grammar. Mm -hmm. 
So what isn't ours is what came out from my deaf participants. Was it please and thank you? Perhaps it wasn't ours. But this handshake was seen very much as being ours from the deaf community. And I'm aware that he and people use that as well in a polite form. Are we okay with what's going on now? There's a lot of commotion here. <laughs> Can you sign this? Oh, yeah. Should we just read them out if you've got the mic? Mm -hmm. Okay. People beaming in from outside. Um, Jill is saying, I can't comment on it, and YouTube it won't let me. Can you ask if there is variation in politeness linked to gender? Doesn't say whether that's BSL or English, just says general. In the research I did with BSL participants, there was no variation in gender. Within linguistic politeness, generally, in spoken language, yes, there is variation in gender. And a lot of the older research say men do it this way, women do it this way. And actually, more of, more of the recent research um, takes a different perspective on it and says that there are more masculine ways of being polite and more feminine ways of being polite, but you can't label it as men do this and men do, women do this. It's just that there tends to be more masculine ways and tends to be more feminine ways. Uh, but yes, in spoken language, certainly there is difference. We have another question from Audrey, who says, brilliant presentation. <laughs> Audrey, brilliant presentation in response to Um, in response to Andy's comment, should politeness be taught to future deaf children if they're not acquiring it from their deaf parents or their peer group? Thank you for your question, Audrey. I'm probably not qualified to answer that. However, the research I mentioned before showed that it would be very helpful for second language users and that they would certainly benefit from explicit tuition about politeness rules, what to use and when to use it. So if a deaf child has grown up with an absence of you know, either language and they're not able to acquire this back through observation, then I would say then absolutely research shows that they would benefit from explicit tuition of politeness rules. Mm -hmm. It seems sensible. I can feel myself practicing the polite duck here whenever I pass the camera, but um, I don't know if that's kind of what your research is. Are there any more questions? Then I would like to once more uh, thank you very, very much, Rachel, for this really fascinating talk and also for this really interesting discussion that we had afterwards. So thank you very much. And sorry, <laughs> I was just going to thank you since we're you know, all being polite, but not only because of that. Thank you both to... Um, uh, Marian and Yvonne for interpreting tonight. As you all know, they're doing this on a voluntary basis, so double thanks as usual. And I'd also like to thank Barry for providing technical support and uh, creating this live streaming, which seems to have worked really well tonight. I also want to announce uh, the next two events that we scheduled for EdSign. And first of all, Suzanne Ehrlich, who's in the audience, will be presenting on the 8th of February on the topic of iPad technology and how iPads can act as a bridge to interpreting access, particularly in education. Um, so this has been part of our schedule um, for some time now, but we also just added a new event. And uh, Karen Emery, who Rachel mentioned at the end of her talk just now, will actually come, be coming to Edinburgh um, on the 24th of February. 
This is an event organized by the linguistics and psychology departments of Edinburgh University, but we are allowed to advertise it through Ed Sign, and we'd very much welcome you all of there. So that event will be on Monday, the 24th of February, and it'll be at a different time and a different place. So from three o'clock, and it will be in the Appleton Tower. There are per Appleton Tower. And I think Rachel is just passing around posters and uh, more information. Please also do check our website. Suzanne Ehrlich's talk will be at Harriet Watt, and the room is yet to be decided, and we will post that online. So thank you very much again for coming tonight. And once more, thank you, Rachel, for this fab presentation. Cheers. Yes. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So that was a really nice one. Really, 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 really